straight to the point. He doesn't mention any of the earthly genealogies. And he goes straight to the point that saying he is the word of God and he was God. Amen? Amen. Amen. He goes straight to exalting and showing us that he is the son of God. And I want you to notice what a lofty opinion John has of Christ. He tells us that he's in, in the beginning with God, part of the Trinity, part of the, the Trinity. And he created man, the Bible says, in verse uh, 3, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. And so right at the first two verses, he tells us that he is God and that he is the creator. He did not need us, and, and, and that is not why he created us. God created us out of his superabundance, out of his creativity, out of his love. He created man, and Christ here, he sits on the throne of the universe, he is the Word incarnate, the great creator. We have the angels in Isaiah 6 that we saw are crying out to him day and night. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And so right here at the beginning of John's gospel, and John's whole purpose is to reveal unto us Jesus Christ. He exalts the Lord. And at the end of John's gospel, he tells us why. He says, he says, many other miracles. Many other things did the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we had books, I don't think the world could contain enough books to tell all about Jesus Christ, he said. But he says, these things have I written unto you that you might believe in the name of the Son of God. Amen. That you might believe. You know, that's not just for salvation. Us as believers, if we're going to be revived, we need to believe in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? We need to have a faith that says, I'll be standing on the promises of the Word of God. Amen. So that I can stand. So he exalts Christ here. And not only is he high, but he is holy. He is holy. You know, he's not just something that we wear around our necks. He's not just something that we put on our front yards. He is uh, the ruler of the universe. He's the highest of the highest. We know that, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, and uh, remember, uh, coming out of the Going to church and coming back from church there. Sometimes in the Philippines you see people coming out of the Roman uh, Catholic early in the morning. Um, and, uh, you know, the, a lot of times the countenance, they're sad. They come in sad, they leave sad. But uh, at our church we come in and we leave happy. Amen? Amen. We live happy and we go to the restaurant. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Amen. But, I, you know, I, I saw that and they were... Uh, of course, my, you know, all my family growing up that way as well. There'd be the, uh, the statue there of Jesus on the cross, and they're loving it and saying, "Please help us! Please help us!" And they're there, and the statue is going to say, "I can't get out of here." Place. Also, there's a big statue of Mary and a, a big, big, uh, you know, feet and uh, dozens of feet of statue of Mary, and she's like this, and everybody's praying to her. And it's, my dad said, It's because she's saying, What do you want me to do? <laughs> I can't have no power. <laughs> Amen? Amen. Amen. But you know, here in our Bible, we see John, he's not dealing with, with, with idols. He's lifting up the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. He's saying, the, the Word, He's here. And, and it's not only that. He's, in verse 14, the Word was made flesh. You know, we'll just skip ahead. Um, but the application this morning is going to be, we have the Word as well. Amen. Amen. And this Word is meant to be made flesh to us. To be flesh out. That we live out the Word of God. That is revival. When you have the word of God coursing through you, and you live it out. So he lifts up the Lord Jesus Christ, and we could we could preach all day long of, of the Lord and how great he is. And each book of the Bible, he's uplifted. In Genesis, he's the creator. In Exodus, he's the deliverer. In Leviticus, he's the lawgiver. We could look through and how he is lifted up, and, and, how, and how he has been given a name which is above every name. But I want you to notice here that God had one son. And he made him a missionary. You realize that? He had one son, the Lord. The Lord and he made him a missionary. He, he, he let go. He gave him. He sent him to us. God had one son and he made him a missionary. And he sent down to us to be humble. Uh, for an example of this, uh, one of the, my favorite passages is Philippians chapter 2. 
Philippians chapter 2. Of course, it will be there in John mostly, but Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. <coughs> Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. It says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Who being in the form of God, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Meaning, he knew who he was. Verse 7, but, he, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being fashioned as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He humbled himself. I want Jack to just, to just uh, if we can this morning, to just slow down and let that sink in. This God trying to see how high and how holy he is, he stepped down to become one of us. Amen? Amen. Become one of us. He came to me. I love that old gospel song, He Came to Me. You know that one? He came to me when I could not go to where he was. He came to me. That's why he died on Calvary when I could not come to where he was. He came to me. Amen. Amen. We could not go to where he was. I love what a quote from Spurgeon. He said, if, if we're going to get to heaven, he said, if we must have a ladder. If a ladder is going from earth to heaven, it is no good unless it comes all the way down to earth. Amen? Amen? It also is no good if it comes from earth but doesn't reach all the way up to heaven. And that's why our Savior had to be 100% man and 100% God. Amen? Amen. So he, he comes down here. He ministers to us. First. He leaves heaven. He comes to earth. We, we know it. And he, he, he leaves the throne of heaven to be born into a filthy place. Why was he born where the animals were? Why was he born where the lambs were born? Because he would be the Lamb of God, amen, that would take away the sin of the world. But he leaves heaven in all of its regal splendor, in all of the throne, in all of what Isaiah saw. He leaves it, he steps down into a sin-stained world. And at the time that he was born, they were under political oppression. Israel was enslaved to the Romans. He was born into that. He was born into a time of political corruption. Anyway, it's still corrupt. Nothing's changed. Amen. When I was in the Philippines last, the senators made an announcement. He said, no, we are proud to say that we are still corrupt, but we are not as corrupt as the others. <laughs> Can you believe that? <laughs> and they're happy with that. Corruption. But Christ is born into a world that is in political corruption. Not just that, in religious corruption. The Pharisees are ruling his day misguiding souls with religion that, and, and not tr uh, preaching the one true gospel, not pointing people to the one true God. He's surrounded by a world of sinners and a hypocritical self-righteous religion. The spotless Lamb of God steps into this sin-stained world to reach us. He steps into that. And not just that, he fulfilled his mission. Amen. He said at the end of his life, he lived a 33 and a half year life, and they say... That Christ was given at the prime of his life, of course, because the Old Testament sacrifices, they would all, always offer a lamb at the prime of his life in perfect condition. And Jesus was 33 and a half when he was offered. So they say, if you are 33 and a half, that you are at the prime of your life. Who here is, uh, <laughs> who here is above uh, 33 and a half? <laughs> no, I know you're lying. <laughs> And a half, you're at the prime of your life. I'm still not there. 27. Some of you are uh, over. That's okay. Amen? Amen. No more amen there. We are unacceptable. Jesus, at, at that point in his life, of course, he went to the cross, but he could say at the end of the cross, he said, It is finished. Amen? amen. Tell us that. You know, in the Greek world, when a, when a famous painter would finish the last dot on his masterpiece, he would say that term. He would say tetelestai. It is finished. It is completely done. When they were doing an important legal transaction, uh, the lawyers would say, it 
is done. finished. And so when Christ on the cross, he could say, it is finished. He lived a perfect, sinless life. He was faithful to preach all during his life. Of course, he called the 12 disciples and, and uh, taught them and discipled them. He faithfully rebuked, of course, the Pharisees about misguiding souls to Christ. And he went to the cross. We know he bore our sin. And if it's mind-boggling, but the New Testament tells us that he became sin for us. He took apart our sin in such a way that he became sin. He became sin. He bore our, Peter tells us, he bore our sin in his body on the tree. He took upon him the form of a servant. He was obedient unto death, even the death. Of the cross. But praise the Lord, it didn't end there. Three days later, he rose again. Amen. Amen. The reason we assemble on Sunday morning, because it was a Sunday morning, some 2,000 years ago, that Christ was risen from the grave. Amen. Amen. That's the only time you'll find a rock and roll on Sunday morning, because they took the rock, the angels, and they rolled it away. Amen. Amen. That's the only place. But when it comes, when it comes to worshiping God, we want to lift him up. The reason we assemble Sunday morning is because he is risen. And if on Sunday he could rise... From the dead, we ought to be able to rise from the bed. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Assemble on Sunday morning. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. But all that, just to say this, that was all introduction. Amen. He left us with a great commission. He finished, he said, I finished the work which thou hast gave me to do. And he said unto us, 